Hello and welcome to the first episode of Elden Ring Dissected. If you're new to the channel, I do deep dives into the mechanics of the Souls games, and today I'll be taking a close look at how fall damage works. Like a lot of players, I've been wondering why it often feels inconsistent. There are some surprisingly high falls you can take without losing any health, and there are others that result in death when you were convinced that it should have been survivable. At a first glance, it really looks like the game isn't following any kind of consistent rule set, but as we dig deeper, we'll learn that it's actually a lot more uniform throughout the game than our intuition tells us. And just as a quick spoiler warning, if you're not too far into the game, this video should still hopefully be okay to watch. I'm going to show footage mostly from the first couple areas. If I go any further than that, it'll be brief, and I'll do my best not to reveal the context too much. I also won't be showing any footage from boss fights or talk about NPCs or lore, but I will have to mention a few items that affect fall damage. With that being said, let's get started. So, for those who are convinced that fall damage is kind of random, or that different spots play by different rules, let's just clear that up right away. That is not the case. There are a few scripted spots, like this fall from Dark Souls 3, where fall damage is simply turned off, but aside from that, the same rules are being followed everywhere. Falls from exactly 16 meters or higher is when a fall causes damage. Falls from exactly 20 meters or higher is when a fall is guaranteed to cause death. This right here is an example of something that's just a hair under 16 meters, the highest fall you can land without taking damage. And here's an example of a fall that's just barely under 20 meters, the highest fall you can survive. If we consider these numbers and compare it to how it works in Dark Souls 1, we have our first answer as to why it feels inconsistent when it really isn't. Elden Ring feels a lot more generous with fall damage than previous Souls games, but that's only half the story. In Dark Souls 1, fall damage was taken when falling from just 5 meters or higher. By changing that to 16 in Elden Ring, you can now fall from a little over 3 times the distance without taking any damage. But this might give you a false sense of security, thinking that it's always going to be a lot more generous when the height of lethal falls actually remains unchanged. That was also 20 meters in Dark Souls 1. So Elden Ring is a lot more forgiving for awarding any kind of damage from falls, but the moment at which it's guaranteed to kill you hasn't changed whatsoever. So if you thought to yourself, wow, I can safely fall from a lot higher than in Dark Souls, no, that's not always the case. We should also consider the damage window. Judging precise distances when looking down in a 3D space isn't something I think anyone can easily do. But the difference compared to Dark Souls 1 is that it had a massive damage window. With damage occurring at 5 meters and above, that means there was a 15 meter window where you could take damage from falls but also survive them. So you had a pretty wide ballpark of falls that hurt you but didn't come close to killing you, which was a little easier to understand on a gut level. In Elden Ring, between 16 meters for taking damage and 20 meters for guaranteed death, that means there's only a 4 meter window for taking damage. Anytime you take damage from a fall in Elden Ring, even if you don't lose that much health, you are actually pretty close to dying. And speaking of which, let's take a closer look at how the fall damage works. Just like in Dark Souls 1, when you take damage from a fall, it's removing some percent of your maximum HP. This means that increasing your vigor to have more overall health does nothing to make falls more survivable. If we were to mod our HP bar to be very small, we'll still always survive falls that are slightly under 20 meters, because the game is only concerned with removing a percentage of our health. How it works is that a 16 meter fall removes 30% of your HP by default, so a character with 1000 health will have 700 when falling the shortest distance that can possibly cause damage. And for falls that are just a hair under 20 meters, the game removes half of your health. There are a few things that affect these numbers, and I'll talk more about them in a moment, but by default the range of fall damage is anywhere from 30% at the least to 50% at most. This is once again another thing that might make it feel a bit unintuitive and unpredictable. When you survive a fall with just a little over half health, you might have gotten the impression that you could have fallen a decent amount further. After all, you still had all of that health left, right? But again, in order to lose half of your health, you can't possibly fall any further and still survive. So this explains every ledge that seems to behave inconsistently. I've seen a lot of comments where someone laments the randomness of how the same fall seems to sometimes kill them or only remove half of their health. But now we know that's because they're falling from somewhere that is very, very close to exactly 20 meters, and subtle differences in how that fall is performed can result in different outcomes. There's a lot of places where this applies. When you're above the valley that surrounds Murkwater Cave, 
Most of this is a decent amount higher than 20 meters, so the vast majority of this cliff ledge is a lethal fall. But some spots where it gets lower brings us closer to 20, and that's where some falls become survivable, but you still have to be careful. This fall from right here above the cave's entrance is roughly 19 meters. Though if you did want to get down to Murkwater Cave quickly from Murkwater Coast, you can also just do this. It's a bit risky, but there's some collision along this pillar. The fall down to that is less than 16 meters, and the same is true for the fall from there down to the ground below, so no fall damage is taken. Perhaps an even better example of something that's dangerously close to the cutoff is this spot by the seaside ruins. When we step too far forward, we'll die. But while we're down here, we can see that the ground behind was a little higher than where we landed. So if we're careful to step off slowly, at an angle that doesn't push as far forward, we'll survive. This is a spot where a difference in centimeters determines our fate, which can make it feel random. So if you're wondering if this is really consistent, or if the overworld functions differently from some dungeons and castles, yes, it actually is consistent. I've yet to find an area that breaks these rules, and here's one other example that I know a lot of people have been surprised by. Over here in Castle Morn, there's a fall that feels shockingly high for not causing any fall damage. But as it turns out, it's just incredibly close to 16 meters. It's so close, in fact, that it's only 2 centimeters short. This means stepping off from these bricks, that are only a little bit higher, does result in taking damage. We can also demonstrate that jumping does add a little bit of height to your fall, also causing fall damage when departing from the same part of the ledge that's normally safe. And if you're wondering how the Longtail Cat Talisman and the Assassin's Approach Incantation affect fall damage, these are two things that both promise to reduce or negate it. But they both work the exact same way as each other, and it's quite simple. You won't take any fall damage while they're in effect but the breakpoint for lethal falls remains unchanged. So this means that using them allows you to fall 19.999 meters without taking any damage, but they do nothing at all to help prevent lethal falls. It's only helping for that 4 meter window, which means you're probably better off equipping something else. So I previously said that the game, by default, has fall damage ranging from anywhere between 30% to 50% of your HP, but there are a couple of modifiers. You might have noticed that dexterity is stated to reduce fall damage, so how does that work? What happens is that it simply reduces fall damage within the existing breakpoints. It doesn't change the height at which falls cause damage or become lethal. Those are fixed at 16 and 20 meters, no matter what. But if and when you do take fall damage, having higher dexterity can reduce it. The benefits of dexterity don't begin until you're at 21 dexterity or higher, so regardless if you have the lowest amount of starting dexterity, which is 9 for the hero class, or the highest dexterity of 16 as a warrior, all starting classes experience fall damage exactly the same, and everyone's going to have to level up dexterity beyond 20 to start benefiting from that. But the impact of dexterity on fall damage is incredibly marginal. The impact is so absurdly minor that it might as well have been a hidden bonus of the stat, and maybe didn't need to be mentioned as a feature of it. It has no cap, and it does continue reducing fall damage all the way up to 99 dexterity, but even when taken all the way up to 99, it only reduces 50% HP loss down to 40% on 20 meter falls, and for 16 meter falls, it only reduces 30% HP loss down to 24%. So if leveling dexterity all the way up to 99 seems worth it to you to experience the difference between this and this, have fun grinding for that incredibly negligible benefit. If you want to see how this all looks on a graph, here's what that looks like. Apologies for the somewhat random plotting along the x-axis, but after a certain point I figured I saw enough. Over here we can see that from base dexterity up to 20, that there's no impact on fall damage at all. Then from 21 to 99, it ultimately arrives at 40% and 24% HP loss for 20 meter and 16 meter falls respectively. As we can see, the damage reduction isn't perfectly linear from 21 to 99, there is a bit of a curve to it where it starts a little stronger, but because the curve isn't really that steep, and because the impact is so marginal in the first place, there's not really anything like a soft cap for fall damage reduction. While dexterity is the only stat to have a direct impact on fall damage, endurance can also have an impact, depending on your character's build. This is where the other modifier to fall damage kicks in, which is your equip load. Depending on how heavy you are, you might take some extra damage from falls. But Elden Ring diverges here from previous Souls games a little. This time it does consider your equip load ratio. What I mean is that in Dark Souls 1, 
The way that extra damage was incurred from being heavier is that it only considered your total weight regardless of anything else. It didn't matter if you were fast rolling or heavy rolling, the same weight, independent of how it affected your movement, always had the same impact. So the cap at which being heavy hurt you the most was a fixed, kind of big number, but it felt oddly specific and random. The change for Elden Ring makes this particular aspect a little more intuitive. Now we don't have to think in terms of specific numbers as much as what your general status is. The good news is that it's not only zero equip load characters that experience the default range of HP loss. While in Dark Souls 1, putting on just a tiny bit of weight made a slight impact, there's actually no impact whatsoever in Elden Ring for light and medium characters. So as long as you're not heavy, your weight is not increasing your fall damage at all. But when your character has a heavy load, it's not just one particular debuff to fall damage that you'll experience. This is where how heavy you are does start to make minor differences. For starters, the fall damage debuff is essentially just turned on when you become heavy, and it hasn't had a chance to grow or worsen if you just tiptoed over that line. What I mean is that your character is considered heavy from 70% to 100% of your quip load, but if it happens to be exactly 70% and not a hair over, you also won't be penalized. Though decimal places can matter, a good ballpark explanation is that higher fall damage isn't really experienced until you're roughly 71% equip load and higher. At these lower amounts of being heavy, the effect is very negligible, but it crescendos to a 10% increase on damage at 100% equip load. So even then, the effect is still pretty minor. It's not until you're pretty much overburdened that fall damage only becomes 10% worse. And when I say 10%, we're not talking about 10% of your total HP, but rather a percentage of the original fall damage amount, a percent of a percent. So when 20 meter falls reduced exactly half of your health before, that same fall now reduces 55% of your HP when you're at 100% equip load. And when a 16 meter fall previously reduced 30% HP, that now reduces just 33% HP. This continues to scale all the way up to being overburdened by having a 150% equip load, where the increase to fall damage is now 30% instead of 10%. So a 20 meter fall in that case causes a loss of 65% HP, and a 16 meter fall causes a loss of 39% HP. This is once again quite negligible, and it's another instance of Elden Ring being more generous in this regard. And despite tying your weight to your equip load ratio being something that's easier to understand, I do think the very low damage amounts might be part of what's confusing. In Dark Souls 1, the maximum survivable fall when you didn't weigh anything at all removed 70% of your HP. The way this all works, it seems funny that you can't fall from slightly higher and lose a little bit more of that health, but it makes a little more sense with how that was designed there. That remaining 30% of your HP was allocated for being heavier. When you hit the maximum weight threshold in Dark Souls 1, the maximum survivable fall now removed basically all of your health, and it would always leave you with exactly 1 HP if you could line that up perfectly. So the remaining overhead here might add a little to the confusion, once again making it look like you should probably be able to survive falling a little further than you just did, but it doesn't work that way. There's no scenario where a near deadly fall can take you down to just a small sliver of health, if your health was full before you fell. The heaviest Elden Ring build takes less fall damage than the lightest Dark Souls 1 character. So when I mentioned that I was researching fall damage for this game, I got a ton of comments and private messages informing me that the time spent falling affects your fall damage. So if something causes you to maybe get stuck a little and fall for a little longer, that this will hurt you more or cause you to die. This appears to be a widespread misconception that a lot of people seem very confident about, but I think we can crush this theory with a bit of testing. I'm going to say with confidence that this is absolutely not how fall damage works, and that the game is really only concerned with the specific breakpoints of 16 and 20 meter falls. It's only paying attention to the distance you've fallen, essentially comparing Y coordinates. So yes, there is a separate mechanic for killing you directly if you get stuck in a falling animation for too long, but that doesn't affect how much damage is taken, nor what's considered a lethal fall if you manage to hit the ground eventually. There's a few ways we can check this. Using Cheat Engine, I'm going to teleport to just a sliver underneath 20 meters above the ground. We can see that I've lost half health, and if the duration of fall mattered, then falling for slightly longer from the same height should kill me, because we're only literally a couple millimeters away from guaranteed death. You heard right, millimeters, not centimeters. What I can do is lock that coordinate when I teleport to it, and this gets me stuck in a falling animation. It only takes a little over 2 seconds to fall 20 meters, but I'm going to extend the duration of the fall by an extra 10 seconds, which should be way more than enough to kill me if the time spent falling mattered. 
In the end, there's no difference. We only lose half health. If you're not convinced and want to see what happens when you're stuck in a falling animation that doesn't require awkwardly teleporting a bunch rapidly, there's another method we can try. Switching to the free cam controls with this cheat dungeon table causes an issue where you get stuck in a falling animation when dismounting from Torn. We can also cause ourselves to fall for an amount of time that should be enough to kill us at least three times over if duration mattered, but we won't take any damage at all because we never fell further than 16 meters. If for some reason you're still not convinced, we can do the opposite. If duration doesn't matter, teleporting slightly above the ground immediately after stepping off of a high ledge should cause instant death, even though we'll spend significantly less time falling compared to how long a lethal fall usually takes. If the game's aware that the distance was greater than 20 meters, that's the only thing that should matter. And that's exactly what happens. But I did mention that falling for too long can kill you, and that is very much a real thing that's been around since Dark Souls 1. Unrelated to normal fall damage, this is a sort of failsafe that makes it so that if you fall out of bounds without hitting a kill box, or if you get stuck in a falling animation that you can't escape, that you won't be stuck forever. In Dark Souls 1 and Bloodborne, this timer was 30 seconds long, but at some point they probably realized that might be too awkwardly long of a wait. So with Dark Souls 3, they shortened the timer's length to roughly 12 seconds or so, and this system was copied over exactly to Elden Ring. But another quirk of this that also comes from Dark Souls 3 is what happens if you go really far out of bounds. You'll often die after falling for just 3 seconds, so the length of this timer can be shortened significantly depending on where you are. So I think the dog in the room here is going to be Torrent. Fall damage appears to be particularly inconsistent when you're on horseback. Unfortunately, I couldn't figure out a way to modify our coordinates in this state, so millimeter level accuracy for testing fall damage and death break points isn't an option for now, but we can still get some things ironed out. First off, there's no reason to suspect that it works any differently. Knowing how close this particular spot back at the seaside ruins is to the 20 meter cutoff, we can see a falling slightly too far forward still kills us, compared to falling slightly closer back. We get the exact same results as we did without being on horseback, indicating that the breakpoints for fall damage and lethality remain unchanged. One thing I've been unable to square away is how much damage Torrent takes based on fall height, so that might be something to revisit with more testing precision at a later time. And for the same reason, I'm also going to gloss over the reduced damage we take for now, but it is reduced for the player while riding Torrent. It's somewhere in the ballpark of being halved. But this is also a good place to clear up any confusion on double jumping with Torrent. I've seen speculation towards two very different conclusions. One being that it should reduce fall damage due to reducing your fall velocity, or that it should actually increase fall damage due to prolonging the length of your fall. These are both incorrect though, and I'm fairly confident in saying that it doesn't change anything. We've already ruled out the time spent falling as something that matters, but if there was any hope of the double jump helping us survive longer falls, Surely it should help in a spot where we're not even a full meter beyond a lethal fall. As we can see, it clearly does nothing to help. There is also a point where falling too far prevents Torrent from being able to double jump, and though I can't say for certain the exact height at which that occurs, that also appears to be very close to 20 meters. Because of the lack of precision in my testing with Torrent, I can also only hypothesize about fringe cases where Torrent dies but the player survives. I don't think this is something that was fully intended, but nor do I think it's a glitch, exactly. It's kind of a rare thing that can happen when you straddle the boundary of Deadly Falls. Oh, this is of course assuming that Torrent had full health before you made the jump. If it was partially drained before the fall, then there's nothing strange about it. The same falls under normal circumstances should be lethal to both of you but I believe that it's technically possible to not fall as far as your horse did. The manner in which the player gets kicked off the horse might sometimes have them landing slightly higher than where the horse's feet made contact with the ground. In other words, I believe it's hypothetically possible for the horse to fall 20 meters, while for the player it only gets counted as something like 19.9 meters. 
And when this happens, it's yet another thing that might make the fall damage appear inscrutable. In this moment, you might look at your health bar and think that, despite Torrent dying, that it wasn't a big deal for you, when in reality, you were once again mere centimeters away from death. But this isn't the end of the story with Torrent. Just because this video up until now has been trying to clarify that fall damage is a lot more consistent than everyone thinks, that's not to say I don't recognize that there's some pretty nasty jank here. Take a look at this. No amount of explaining that will justify it working out that way. But this isn't the fall damage breakpoints faltering, there's just some sloppiness with how Torrent lands. It seems that if you jump immediately after landing, especially on some sloped or uneven surfaces, that it sometimes fails to register having landed in the first place. Even though we know that Torrent landed for real, because it's allowing another physical jump off of the ground, and not just a mid-air double jump. Where I ultimately wound up is just barely a lethal fall from the top of there, so the game is still trying to think in terms of a 20 meter fall. That hasn't changed. But with Torrent, it just sometimes fails to recognize having made contact with the ground if you only touch it briefly. Now, sloped surfaces have a long history in the Souls games of not stopping fall damage, so it's not too surprising when sliding down steep cliffs results in death, but this clip sent to me I think highlights the problem most clearly. Here we have another awkward death without an obviously steep surface involved. That's not to say that some uneven ground by the crystals might not be to blame, that still might be part of the problem. But take a look at what happens when I land where they initially landed. I lose health because this is over 16 meters, in fact it's pretty close to 20. But when we review their footage, we can see that they didn't take damage when they landed there, even though they should have. Their health remains full until their moment of death. This is more evidence that quickly jumping after landing with Torrent sometimes fails to be counted as landing. This can cause deaths that really shouldn't happen when a follow-up jump helps cross that 20 meter boundary from the initial location of descent. Spirit Springs are another point of contention. They're not only to be used for jumping very high into the air, but you can land directly on top of them from extremely high up with Torrent without dying as well. But because you lose your ability to double jump after falling far enough, the inability to course correct can make it a bit tricky sometimes. There's been a lot of speculation that the safe landing area surrounding these spirit springs must be inconsistent in their size, and this time these observations have been spot on. For the spirit spring by the seaside ruins, I've been able to land a little over 12 meters from the center of it and survive. And for the spirit spring in Kalid, I've landed roughly 3 meters away, yet somehow died, so the discrepancy is massive. I wonder if this comes from an intention to have the spirit springs used in a certain way. It could be argued that the Seaside Ruin Spirit Spring is the intended way to get down to that beach, whereas most other Spirit Springs are used to travel upwards, so they made its safe landing zone much bigger. That's the only somewhat rational explanation I can think of, but it's still not good. Once you learn that you can land on these safely, having some be extremely more restrictive than others isn't the right choice, especially for an open world game where the idea is that you might approach some areas from a different direction. If it were my call, I'd make all of them as generous as the one by the Seaside Ruins. The game of course has kill boxes as well, which are areas that automatically kill the player regardless of fall damage. This is how dying from dropping off into water works. The game isn't considering how far we've fallen, and it's only responding to us having passed through an invisible death barrier. But this doesn't only happen at sea level, it's also commonly found by steep cliffs with no intended way down, because there's no point in following the player all the way down. The game might as well kill us off sooner. It's also often used in things that are intended to be bottomless pits, like elevator shafts. Much more often than not, you can tell when these games don't want you to go down somewhere, so they're not problematic the majority of the time. But a few really egregious examples have popped up in previous Souls games, like this particular spot in Blighttown. So it'll be interesting to see where the biggest offenders will be found in Elden Ring. One issue is that the Rainbow Stone is supposed to inform us of lethal falls. When you drop one off a ledge, it'll shatter if it's too far down. But there are some places where they fail to recognize kill boxes, like in this clip shared by Jacob Geller. There's also the issue of areas where the kill box implementation is a bit sloppy. Normally every time you pass through one, you also enter the death cam state, where the camera stops following you and just points down in your direction. But these two things aren't always neatly paired, and several locations have been found where triggering only the death cam while surviving is possible. 
To avoid showing too many later game areas, here's one that we can encounter in the Impaler's Catacombs. This fall here is survivable when a kill box should have prevented this. But the funny part is that the bottom of this pit is only a couple centimeters away from being a lethal fall regardless. So even without the kill box, this wouldn't have been an issue if they made the bottom of that pit just a tiny bit lower. But what happens if you survive down here for more than 10 seconds might be a problem. In the Souls games, the bloodstain that you'll drop when you die follows you on a 10 second delay, which can be visualized here using the debug menu for Dark Souls 1. This is to ensure that your bloodstain isn't always dropped precisely where you died, so they don't follow you into pits or weird areas. This works out most of the time, but there are some glitchy locations where that doesn't always play out as intended, like in this pit in the Impaler's Catacombs. To worsen the problem, because you can survive the fall, players will put messages down here. So if you're playing online, you might get the impression you're supposed to go down there. It's pretty funny, but also unfortunate if you cared about those runes. So there's just a few more loose ends to cover here. At the beginning of the video, I mentioned that there's scripted locations where fall damage is negated. To be as light on spoilers as possible, I'm only going to show one that's nearest to the beginning of the game, and I'm going to be vague about its location. But there's this spot where these rocks break away, and you can fall much further than usual without dying. This is of course a special exception, and every time you encounter one, it should be fairly obvious that that's what it's doing, and you're not going to find random spots like this just anywhere. I know a few players have gotten the impression that it only works if you make contact with the breakable floor on the way down, as some players have had co-op summons die from the same fall, but that shouldn't be the case. Once we're already down there, I can teleport to very high up in the sky again, and I'll survive it every time. Though there is an issue that occurs if you attack while falling. For whatever reason, it causes you to die. If someone else can determine the exact cause of this, that would be highly appreciated, but it seems to me like they might have only whitelisted the regular falling animation. Hopefully this is something that will be patched. Out of curiosity, I went back to double check Dark Souls 3, and I found that it wasn't a problem there. But drop stabs did get reworked a bit for Elden Ring, so if they reuse the same code for these kinds of falls, it seems possible that it didn't mesh perfectly with some of the changes here. Oh, and one last thing worth mentioning. I've also seen a lot of people speculate about a couple other things that might impact fall damage, like your stamina or the kind of surface you land on. But both of these have no impact. So to summarize the current state of fall damage in Elden Ring, it's a lot more consistent than most players realize, but it's also not their fault for not being able to understand that through intuition. The fact that there's only a 4 meter window of damage, and that the fall damage itself isn't very large, is the source of most of the confusion. You can fall 15.9 meters without taking any damage, you can fall 19.9 meters but only lose half health, and you can fall 20 meters and suddenly die. These all feel like drastically different outcomes, but they all occur very, very near to each other. So when you're looking down over an edge, and you think to yourself, oh, I've survived plenty of falls just like that and I didn't lose much health, you might want to question your own confidence a little. Because no one is really capable of easily judging the difference of 4 meters at over 16 meters away in a 3D space, especially when you're trying to compare other falls by memory. And despite this overall consistency, the biggest issue is that things can get pretty weird with Torrent, which does lead to some unfair deaths. And again, some of those spirit springs really do have too narrow of a safe landing zone. If you're watching this video further out from release, consider keeping an eye on the comments below. If anything gets patched, or if we learn anything new, I'll have that information in a pinned comment. By the time this video is live, I'll also have written a wiki page all about fall damage, so that's something you can refer to if you want all the information more directly without commentary. It's linked in the video description below. And if you have any questions about other Elden Ring mechanics, or just want to share general impressions, please leave a comment below. Just please be respectful of others' opinions, uh, the best thing you can do if you disagree with someone else is to actually leave a completely new comment sharing your thoughts on a given topic. That makes it easier for me to see your direct feedback, and it helps keep things chill, which is the ideal vibe here. I'd like to thank everyone who responded to my Twitter thread, I got a lot of great feedback there that allowed me to double check some of the more questionable areas. I'd also like to thank King Boar for helping identify the exact calculations of Equiplood's effect on fall damage, and also to the community of everyone who's working hard to deconstruct the game and sharing their cheat engine tables. If you'd like to support this channel, please consider doing all the usual stuff that helps the YouTube algorithm. Or you can also become a patron, where I share weekly updates about whatever I'm working on or whatever topic has my interest. Any amount helps. An extra special thanks to all of my backers at the Evil Vagrant tier, Aiden Page, Curtis Ware, Eric W, 
Ethan Ross, Gary Marshall, Harry Pham, Carl Germ, Chris, Lazy Tangent, Lude Frago, Moonblind Witch, Nashwana Zari, Nate Hines, Quinn Parsons, The Majalis Duo, Senatu, and Zelther. Thanks for watching.